Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen. It's really my pleasure to introduce Patrick Tyler, who in many ways needs no introduction. Uh, Patrick uh, is an author of multiple books on China, the Middle East, and most recently the very excellent new book, Fortress Israel, the inside story of the military elite who run the country and why they can't make peace, uh, which um, is uh, a really excellent account of the last several decades of the kind of Israeli national security establishment. And um, obviously it's of considerable interest right now given the recent events in, in Gaza. Uh, in addition to uh, his work as an author, uh, Patrick has had a distinguished career at the New York Times where he was chief correspondent. Uh, he was also Baghdad bureau chief and London bureau chief, Beijing bureau chief, Moscow bureau chief, the list goes on and on. <laughs> and uh, so Patrick is going to talk about uh, the big themes of his book for um, around 20, 25 minutes. And then um, I'll ask him uh, one or two questions and then open up to you, the audience, for questions. And since C-SPAN is covering, bear in mind that uh, you should wait for a mic and identify yourself and ask a question, not make a statement. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction. I uh, am um, very grateful to the New America Foundation to, for organizing uh, this event and uh, for all of you coming out on this blustery uh, morning. Um, Fortress Israel is my second book on the Middle East. And as, as you know, the Middle East is a, is a topic that compels anyone who pretends to any level of expertise to uh, recite a little prayer before one holds forth. And I, I like the one that the late Yo, uh, Mo Udall used to use. He would say, Lord, give us the wisdom to use words that are gentle and, and tender, for tomorrow we may have to eat them. Uh, it's probably a, a pearl of wisdom that Susan Rice probably thinks today she would like, like to have taken with her into that hearing a, a few months ago. In a book called The World of Trouble, uh, published in 2009 by Farrar, I, I wrote about American uh, presidents from Eisenhower uh, forward uh, and how each tried to understand the Middle East and how each tried to uh, uh, impose a, a surprisingly uh, discontinuous uh, agendas with often uh, tragic results. And while, while that book is about America's political system, Fortress Israel is, is a biography of Israel's political culture, which is a uh, undertaking one has to take, uh, make with uh, humility uh, as an American. Going back to Tel Aviv over several years, driving up the hill to Jerusalem and up and down that Mediterranean uh, landscape, I became uh, fascinated with the, how the generals and the intelligence chiefs and the political figures of the, of the ruling elite look out at the world and how strong what I call a, a martial impulse uh, beats in their chest and how self-assured they are in dealing with us, uh, the superpower, uh, as if they were the superpower in a in relationship that uh, would be reversed. Uh, and this book is, of course, not about the Arabs, who comprise the largest culture in the Middle East. Uh, the Arab uh, states are responsible for their own substantial uh, shortcomings on the peace front, but also for a legacy of hatred and incitement against Israel that has to be uh, dealt with in advance. It must be said, uh, the Arab leaders have shown a deep hostility to the idea of Jewish nationhood. And unlike their forebears in history, who protected and sheltered Jewish communities, they have shown little empathy for a people uh, devastated by annihilation and, and Holocaust in Europe. So this book is about Israel's political culture. And it's most pointedly a biography of a modern Sparta, the story of a military society and a powerful defense establishment, uh, a, a ruling elite who have found it very difficult over the decades to engage in the processes of peace, and who evince a warrior kind of ethos that overpowers every other institution in national life. Uh, the ruling elite in Israel is not a large class. There have been only 10 uh, prime ministers uh, since David Ben-Gurion, if you, if you do the double counting. Uh, and so it is possible to introduce them as characters in a group biography, and that is, that is what I have tried to do. Um, uh, we must 
always remind ourselves in looking at any nation's history that all politics is local. Uh, and in Israel, during the first decade of statehood, the pioneer spirit began to flag. Uh, when Israelis were short of water, they short of good agricultural base, uh, and when the bright sheen of Ben-Gurion's leadership began to fade because young people were less and less interested in pursuing military service as a career than they were in pursuing what young people everywhere are interested in, career, uh, relationships, etc. Ben-Gurion needed in the mid-1950s, uh, he realized, to remobilize uh, the country. And so he began preaching about a sense of new national peril as a voice in the wilderness. Most of his peers, crucially, at the top of what became the Labor Party, Golda Meir, Levi Eshkol, Moshe Sheret, opposed his new militarism, especially Sheret, who became Israel's second prime minister. Uh, and he was a man who most Americans have not heard of, and he believed passionately that Israel's security could only be assured uh, through a strategy of peaceful integration, uh, which required compromise and accommodation with the Arabs. Gamal Abdel Nasser, the Egyptian military uh, dictator who had taken over in 1952, carried on a secret correspondence with Moshe Sheret, facilitated by our Central Intelligence Agency, whose officers believed that Israel and Egypt could come to terms. Yet at the time, Sheret's policy, based on diplomacy, negotiation, integration, was anathema to Ben-Gurion, where Ben-Gurion said we should get ready for war as a nation. His cabinet, however, under Sheret's leadership, said no. Its members were listening to Sheret, who was listening to President Eisenhower and to John Foster Dulles about a new world order of the UN Charter about the strategic importance of peace and of conflict resolution by means other than war and conquest. In other words, an end to militarism that had marked the century. And so, with the help of a one-eyed general, a young man named Moshe Dayan and others, Ben-Gurion sought to undermine and destroy his successor's political career. A willful and remarkable visionary Ben-Gurion understood that the accentuation of national peril was good politics. Uh, better politics he wagered than what Sherratt was selling, diplomacy and negotiation. Ben-Gurion understood that to prevail, one had to win elections, and from this period forward, the period of the mid-1950s, he never strayed from the, the, from the narrative of grave threat and peril that kept his core constituency in lockstep with his vision. From that period forward, he also orchestrated the greatest military buildup in the Middle East and set out with secret French help to build a nuclear weapons complex near D Dimona. And he laid the foundations for the modern IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, and for its doctrine of preemptive warfare uh, at, within a concept of deterrence that is unique to that military culture. Understanding the more fully revealed context of Ben-Gurion's tenure as Israel's paramount leader, how he nurtured and employed the warrior class that included stars like Diane, Ariel Sharon, Yitzhak Rabin, and others, allows us to understand better today that, that Israel remains a nation in thrall to that original martial impulse, a sense among the political elites that the military option is the best and most certain to, to get results, that it is the best way to keep the country and its supporters abroad uh, mobilized, that negotiation and diplomacy are a kind of appeasement and surrender. This ethos, uh, the ethos of Sparta, one could say, always being on the hair trigger uh, for combat, has given rise to succeeding generations of leaders who are stunted in their capacity to wield or sustain diplomacy as a rival to military strategy. One of the first uh, interlocutors I, en I engaged uh, during this period of research was Mike Herzog, who had spent some time here in Washington at the Washington uh, Institute, and he served as chief of staff to Ehud Barak. He comes from one of the founding families. And I put this question to him of how the Israelis look out at the world and the lack of the, the weakness of the diplomatic side of their uh, civil institutions. And he s looked at me very straightforwardly and said, uh, we don't have American culture 
uh, here. You should start with that. We are still in the process of developing civilian bodies, but for now, uh, the whole culture of decision making revol revolves around the military. It's as simple as that. In Israel today, the foreign ministry stands as the only bastion of Israeli diplomacy. It is the house that Moshe Sheret built. Yet the person who occupies the Sheret chair of statesmanship and diplomacy is Avigdor Lieberman, uh, who is a man that I think you could safely say is not that interested in diplomacy, especially with the Arabs. And if he had a policy, it, it is more likely to have abdicated expulsion of the Arabs than engaging them. Um, so to a great extent, uh, in the legacy of Ben-Gurion's organizational decade has made in Israel uh, the army as the country, a, a civilianized army and a militarized uh, civilian culture. Uh, and for half a century, standing at the center of this martial culture have been the Sabras, the, those native-born Israelis whose parents come as pioneers from all over Europe. These young Israelis grew up socialized to violence. They didn't bring the intellectual baggage of their parents. They grew up on the land, defending farms, standing watch at night. Uh, these young Israelis fought with the local Arabs with whom jousting over land and grazing rights. And when the Israelis declared their, war, declared their state in, in 1948, the Arabs attacked them from all sides. As arms and volunteers flooded in, the Israelis discovered a searing, tr a searing truth that war delivers tangible gains for a victor. A Jewish army for the first time in 20 centuries had fought and won, delivering statehood that was uh, immediately recognized by the United States and the Soviet Union. Ben-Gurion was not happy with the boundaries seized in the first round of war, uh, and that's what he called it, and he referred to the second round and the third round that was inevitable in his view. Uh, but they were boundaries that he had not imagined during all those years prior to 48, when he and the leaders of the Zionist movement crisscrossed uh, Europe in search uh, of a homeland, support for a homeland. Diane, who became Ben-Gurion's favorite officer, was the prototype of the Sabras. He had grown up in poverty. He had fought the Arabs in the region of the Sea of Galilee in the Jezreel uh, Valley, where they used stones, clubs, and knives in adolescent combat. A thoroughly secular man, Diane in his lifetime, came to read the Bible incessantly, especially the Old Testament, because for him, it was a manual for war. Uh, he loved the stories of David and Goliath, of Samson, and of the conquest in the book of Judges, um, and he had thought he would become a farmer until the British recruited him as a military scout for their forces, and, and he found his element there. Uh, the British assigned him to the Yorkshire Rifles Battalion that was protecting the British petroleum uh, pipeline that went across Palestine up to the ports of the Med. And the local Arabs kept blowing up the pipeline, uh, protesting uh, British policies for Jewish uh, immigration to the Holy Land. Uh, and the British were uh, determined to put an end to it. And the British commander was a heavy drinker and brass-colored uh, whiskers, and he instructed Diane to go to the local Arab chief chieftain with a, uh, an ultimatum. He said, tell that bastard that if there's any further sabotage of these pipelines, I'll blow up his house. And if there continue to be uh, sabotage, I'll blow up every house in his village. Well, when that didn't put an end to it, you know, Diane suggested there might be a more subtle way uh, to deal with, uh, to, to win Arab cooperation. And the British officer wheeled on him and said, I didn't come here to teach British soldiers how to crawl in your bloody country. I came here to teach the bloody Arabs how the British operate. Well, many years later, when uh, the Israeli army began blowing up uh, Palestinian houses as a means to punish and put down rebellion, people asked where they'd learned such a vile method of collective punishment. Uh, I told this uh, story on a, a, a BBC interview the other night, and there was silence on the other end of the line for a few minutes. <laughs> Uh, for Westerners, uh, Israel presents a difficult problem of perception. A broad swath of Americans, not just Jewish Americans, uh, have admired the pluck and the determination of the Zionist enterprise. But while we have been encouraged to regard Israel as a tiny, tiny and embattled democracy in a sea of Arab hostility, Athens, with its many shared values, it was not Athens as much as Sparta that Ben-Gurion turned to as the model for his state. 
Zionist revolutionaries had once aspired to be a moral beacon, a light unto nations in a benighted region that yearned for development. But after witnessing the uh, destruction of European Jewry, uh, and with the pioneer spirit flagging in the malarial swamps of Israel's coast, Ben-Gurion dramatically shifted his focus in the first decade, uh, building a different uh, kind of polity, a society organized as an army under a concept of self-reliance that called for continuing warfare uh, and military buildup. It was a notion that the struggle with the Arabs would be uh, very, very long, and that they wouldn't understand uh, uh, that they could never succeed and then the, until they were defeated on a serial basis. In less than a decade after its founding, Israel had fielded the most agile and powerful armed forces in the Middle East and had made secret plans with the help of France to, bec to become a nuclear power. By the time the United States, and this is an interesting and important point, by the time the United States got deeply involved in arming Israel in the late 1960s, Israel had already defeated the Arabs in two rounds of war, the War of Independence and Suez, and was preparing to do so for a third time in 1967, and was working urgently to fashion its first two French-supplied atomic explosives to use in case something went wrong in that war. The legacy of those Zionist revolutionaries who had enraptured the parlors of Europe and America is not the light unto nations that the early romantics envisioned. They instead have bequeathed to the Jewish world and to the West a highly militarized dependency, a state that has achieved great feats of cultural and economic development but has failed to build a strong enough institution to balance the military zeitgeist with imaginative and engaging diplomacy. This state of affairs, I would argue, represents one of our greatest challenges in the West. Why? Because here we are, a decade after our last big military intervention in the Middle East, on the knife's edge of making the decision of whether about we go to war with Iran or acquiesce in Israel's decision to launch such a war against Iran. And let me connect this history to the present one more time. Diane, who led Israel uh, to victory in the 56 Suez Crisis and the Six Day War, 67, believed in what he called the detonator strategy. And I'm quoting from him now. This was a talk he gave to his general staff after Suez. When someone wishes to force on us things which are detrimental to our existence, there will be an explosion which will shake up wide areas. And realizing this, such elements in the international system will do their utmost to prevent damage to us. Um, he acknowledged uh, that this was not a very constructive thesis, but it is a thesis, he said, that we should be a kind of a biting beast, capable of developing a crisis beyond our borders. If anyone tries to harm us, the explosion will do damage to others. In trying to assess whether Israel will launch a preemptive attack on Iran's nuclear complex, possibly triggering a broad Middle Eastern war and a new shock to the global economy, Western leaders need, need to take into account Israel's capacity to play this detonator role, which is still intrinsic uh, to the military outlook. Um, and it's a strategy which now closely conforms to how Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is attempting to posture his government uh, by demanding red lines be drawn in the case of Iran as a trigger for war. Netanyahu and his uh, like-minded uh, uh, departing defense minister, Ehud Barak, have been in charge. Uh, Netanyahu keeps a, a portrait of Churchill in his office. One of the former Mossad chiefs likes to remind me. Uh, Barak sees himself as the Ben-Gurion of his generation. Both are products of the Israeli military. Barak was the single most decorated officer uh, in the IDF, and Netanyahu served in a commando unit that he headed. And though the Israeli military and intelligence chiefs have gone to great lengths to say that much of the officer corps opposes an attack on Iran, Netanyahu and Barak have about have half the world convinced that they will launch a military strike as early as uh, perhaps next spring. But the harsh reality is that a prime minister uh, has to obey the law of local politics. Netanyahu remembers that uh, how forcefully the military hierarchy turned against him 
1999, when more than 100 generals joined political parties to drive him out of the prime minister's office. They thought he was a reckless prime minister. Uh, he is working to prevent a repeat of that by seeking a strong majority, if not uh, unanimity, in, in his security cabinet for any war strategy against Iran. From my discussions with Israeli military and political leaders, I believe that despite uh, the drumbeat, uh, the chances of an Israeli attack uh, remain emote, remote. Every study of the military problem uh, Israel faces in mounting airstrikes far from its home territory reveal tremendous risks for the Jewish state. Uh, uh, against palpably insignificant gains in setting back the long-term Iranian ambition to develop a, a nuclear industry by only a year or two. Netanyahu, in my view, will not risk the catastrophe of war, uh, but uh, the danger of miscalculation uh, is growing. Uh, the West can and must oppose a decision by Iran's leaders to enter the military realm of nuclear development, but the United States and other nations will have little credibility if the net effect of our actions is to redline the technological development of another state. Young Iranians who risk their lives for reform and who admire uh, Western democracy, in some cases paying for that admiration with their lives in 2009, are also fiercely nationalistic in defending Iran's right to develop technologically. I like to tell the story of the, of the night that the Imam uh, Ayatollah Khomeini died in, in 1989. I was, the, by a fluke, the only Western correspondent in Tehran, and we were out at 3 o'clock in the morning driving back and forth across the city looking for, uh, checking at all the hospitals to see which one had a, a a, a, a parking lot full of, of Mercedes uh, in them, indicating that uh, Khomeini was inside. Uh, and we came around the corner near one hospital and ran right up against a Pastoran uh, uh, checkpoint, road checkpoint. And there uh, comes this uh, heavily bearded, fierce looking young man with a Kalashnikov and comes to my side of the car and taps the muzzle of it on the glass, indicating that I should roll it down. I roll it down, he looked at me with those ferocious eyes and said, what is the best university for electrical engineering in the United States? <laughs> and so it's a reminder that in our, in, in our um, analytical work, uh, uh, from which the public sometimes takes a sense of demonization about other cultures, that young people everywhere uh, want pretty much the same thing. There are, of course, fanatics. There are extremists. But we have lost touch with a great deal of, of uh, some of the cultures that we find ourselves embattled with. Um, in trying to, uh, uh, however the, the Iranian crisis turns out uh, this winter, next spring, uh, it's not as important as the profound problem uh, that we face uh, in dealing with the potential detonator strategy uh, emanating over the long run. No country has made a greater commitment to Israel's security than the United States. Uh, but nearly every president since Eisenhower has regretted that he didn't push harder for Israel uh, to more fully engage the Arabs by developing institutions of diplomacy uh, and compromise. President Nixon said he would give Israel the hardware of weapons if Golda Meir would supply the software of diplomatic uh, flexibility before the Yom Kippur War. Uh, she disappointed him. President Ford said this, the philosophical underpinning of US policy toward Israel has been our conviction, and certainly my own, that if we gave Israel an ample supply of economic aid and weapons, uh, she would feel strong enough and confident, more flexible and more willing to discuss a lasting peace. Uh, but after serial wars, Ford lamented, uh, I have begun to question uh, the rationale for our policy. Israel deserves our undivided attention and protection, uh, but 60 years after its founding, it remains a nation in thrall of that original martial impulse, the depth of which has given rise to succeeding generations of leaders who embrace only worst case scenarios in a process that magnifies the sense of national peril encourages military preemption, covert subversion, and undermines any chance for a more engaging strategy, diplomacy, based on compromise and accommodation. Uh, 
Both Americans and Israelis should build a monument to Moshe Sheret, this uh, shadowy figure in Israeli history, uh, a lifelong diplomat whose political career was destroyed by the circle around Ben-Gurion. Uh, Sheret admonished his countrymen that the question of peace must not be lost sight of for a single moment, and yet Israel in the modern era is in danger of losing sight of peace. A new generation of generals sees war planning, covert subversion, covert uh, operations, as, and the acquisition of new weaponry as the only effective national strategy. And the West must face the prospect that Israel may not be able to rebuild the strategic consensus for peace, like the one that Sherat built very briefly in the 50s, and like the one Yitzhak Rabin imposed on the military establishment in 1992, an act of courage for which he paid with his life a few years later. As the Jewish state and its military establishment become more hardline, more religious, more prone to propagate a vision of peril and threat, constant peril and threat, America will have to lead the world with an act of courage as great as Rabin's in rebuilding that strategic consensus for peace. Rebuilding it in Israel, rebuilding it in the Congress here, and among the Jewish and fundamentalist Christian communities, who so assiduously and often blindly advocate militarism or applaud it. That will require presidents and presidential candidates to put the security of Israel, the issue of Israel's security, into a new category of bipartisanship, a very tall order for our society. But the Muslim world and Israel are pulling away from each other, and that's the danger. And imagine a, a region in which they were pulling together. Here's the rub. If, on, if Israel only develops the institutions for war and continues to neglect uh, the institutions of diplomacy, peace will remain a distant, distant prospect. Militarism cannot be a foundation for peace, and Americans can militate for peace. As President Eisenhower did, as Kennedy did, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and most of the rest, and we can do so without fear of criticism, for it is in our national interest. Thank you very much. Patrick, thank you very much for that excellent uh, overview of your book. Um, you know, why is it that so much of the pushback on a potential Israeli operation against Iran has actually come out of the national security establishment? Because that would seem to be somewhat at odds with one of the big themes of the book. How do you sort of square that? Mm. Well, the, 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 uh, the pushback has come from the core of the security establishment, but that, that is an indicator uh, I think I would argue that that, uh, that very establishment is delaminated and over the last 15 years has been delaminating to a, to a certain extent. You have Sabras who are now on the you know, hard militarist and believe that uh, what they learned from 19, the, the suicide bombers of 95 and 96 is that, that peace is a distant prospect and they've gone over for a very hard view of, of, of their adversary, whereas others continue to work uh, behind the scenes and in their jobs uh, uh, for and, and believe deeply in uh, engagement with, with the Arabs. Uh, I think uh, also you've got political elements here. When Meyer Dagan, who was the Mossad chief who basically authored much of the covert action that has set back the Iranian military program, it takes a great deal of pride uh, in his accomplishments. It's not that he's a squishy lefty on, on, on the peace front. He simply believes, as a matter of logic, that war is more dangerous than the, covert, than the results mm -hmm. they're getting from the covert side, mm -hmm. and that he doesn't, trust, he doesn't trust Netanyahu to use the war instrument uh, in a neutral way for national interest, as opposed mm -hmm. to a personal political, uh, having a personal political factor in, uh, in it. He, so there's a great deal of mistrust for Netanyahu as a leader, uh, and in, this, and in, in, the, in a in parallel sense, uh, in, and for different reasons, the same mistrust applies to Ehud Barak, who's probably now going to leave this government because he basically has no base if they go into new elections to return to a par the parliament in a way that would justify him being the defense minister. So there's a great deal of, of, uh, of uh, uh, factionalization that has occurred in the military establishment, which has never been monolithic, but it did line up you know, fairly strongly in the first decades. It is now uh, all over the place, and you have factions within the military establishment itself. How, what's your assessment of um, 
uh, we know from David Sanger's reporting, one of your former colleagues, mm. you know, that it's, it's Olympic Games is the kind of code word for a so whole set of covert um, uh, operations against uh, um, Iran. What's your assessment of how successful that was and, and the extent to which some of these assassinations of people involved in the Iranian nuclear program, has that set them back a year or two or is it hard to tell? Or is, it, is it a game changer or not really? Uh, it has certainly uh, set them back uh, a, a year or two. It is certainly very hard to tell, uh, but it's also cer <coughs> certainly a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the extent to which that we go after their industrial base, <coughs> excuse me, can I get some water maybe? Yeah. Hey, Jennifer. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, to the extent that we go after their industrial uh, base, uh, it incites a certain national uh, reaction that is going to work against uh, our uh, any kind of efficacious uh, uh, long-term program to try and take down this uh, nuclear program. Thank you very much. Take down this nuclear program uh, by, by covert action. In, in other words, it can backfire. Uh, when I referred to the nationalism of the, of the younger generation there, <coughs> It's a very strong factor uh, uh, and, and, and very much recognized by, by the leadership. Uh, and, and they're playing on it. Even though the 2009 elections in Iran were such a disaster for the leadership, what they found was that there's this enormous national pride uh, in the nuclear program. Uh, I think the essential problem with the nuclear uh, uh, program is, is, that, is where to set the uh, threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, for nuclear development. Uh, the Iranians insist on being able to uh, uh, enrich uranium uh, for the national power grid for the nuclear reactors they'd like to build to, to make uh, electricity, uh, medical isotopes, <coughs> and other things, while at the same time uh, 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 Netanyahu would like to set the bar much lower, uh, the threshold bar much lower, and prevent them from staying in the uh, uh, uranium enrichment business because it, it is such a brief sprint from there to uh, military technology. Yeah, some of that showed up in the in the in our presidential campaign. There seemed there was a kind of a slightly uh, esoteric discussion of where the red line should be, whether it was capability or or having a, or being close to having a weapon. Can you kind of pass for us a little bit about um, kind of what Netanyahu's red lines appear to be and and what uh, U.S. government red lines are? Uh, is there a difference right now between those two? Uh, there certainly is. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure I can parse it as, as, as finely uh, as uh, it certainly exists uh, in some classified form, but basically uh, uh, the technology of enrichment itself, when, once you get to 20% uh, enriched uh, uranium-235, uh, you there, you're, you're then uh, have a very brief period of time for, to get it up into the uh, 75, 80 percent range that you can start uh, uh, using it to fabricate uh, a, a, a crude uh, uh, an initial uh, nuclear explosive. I think uh, uh, the Iranians argue that we're, we've, we've forsworn nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and that we want this technology to produce electricity, to produce medical isotopes, and to demonstrate uh, uh, that we have the, the technology and also to preserve our oil resources by using nuclear power to, to feed the national grid, to run the national electrical grid, and then sell our, our, our oil resources uh, for, for, uh, for a hard currency. Uh, uh, I think the Obama administration r recognizes, uh, as you look across the planet, across the globe, that you've got so many countries that are at, at a technological level that you can't go redlining them. Uh, and saying you can't uh, uh, proceed past, uh, the, 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 you, you can't proceed to the point of enrichment. You can't proceed into nuclear development. After all, we were the early uh, promoters of nuclear development with Eisenhower's Adams for Peace uh, programs and, and, and others that followed it. Uh, so I think Netanyahu uh, wants a hard uh, determination that uh, the Iranians can't be trusted. Uh, any nuclear work they're doing is an indication that their goal is weaponization, and he would like to set the bar uh, to, to get uh, their, what uh, uh, uranium resources they have under control and to prevent it from being enriched, enriched and also 
uh, they use this uh, term of the um, um, impunity. Uh, what, what is the phrase? Uh, uh, once the, uh, uh, it's the impunity factor or something like that. Once they bury their centrifuges so, far, so deep in a mountain that you can no longer go in even with penetrating bombs to, de to destroy it. And once that line is crossed, uh, they can enrich to their heart's content. They can shut out the uh, IAEA inspectors and dash for uh, a, uh, an enrichment to a high level that they can use to fabricate their first bombs. I think uh, uh, Netanyahu's uh, formulation and his red lines are based on a, a very uh, de a determined uh, uh, conclusion that uh, Iran is after a weapon. Is there any reason to doubt that, by the way? Uh, I think that's extremely hard to tell. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, uh, you know, we've had, we've had these relationships uh, with uh, countries and allies that we suspected were developing weapons, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, uh, and it Pakistan. is pa pa Pakistan and, and Israel. I mean, right. Ben-Gurion uh, came to the White House more than once and looked into the eyes of American presidents and said, no, that's, for a, that's a plant that's going to do some uh, water desalinization and uh, medical isotopes. Don't, you don't have to worry about us. Uh, so uh, very hard to say. You have a fatwa from Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, that's a very important. Uh, indication in their culture and in their religion that uh, at the top of the policy a decision has been made. Uh, in the Revolutionary Guard structure, which is, uh, uh, has its own uh, power centers, it's hard to say whether they're in a, a complete ideological alignment on that question. It's hard to understand uh, to what extent uh, they have the authority to push the technology farther as a way of contingency preparation for the day when the Ayatollah may change its mind. Yeah, and I've heard Gary Sick refer to sort of a Japanese option where you're six months away, but you're not actually at the point where you have a, a weapon, but you're very close. Sure, and, and uh, I, I think that, that uh, Obama, if, if you read what uh, is coming out of the White House over the last two years, would not like to get that far advanced right. uh, with Iran, <laughs> uh, but would like to uh, acknowledge some way, to be able to state publicly that the United States in uh, perhaps developing a new grand bargain with Iran is not adverse uh, to the level of technological development that, that Iran you know, ostensibly uh, articulates, and that is developing a national industry of nuclear uh, power for uh, um, electrical production and other peaceful uh, purposes. What did you make of the timing of uh, the kind of Gaza events? Was there any time, you know, particular point to the timing, or was it just random happenstance? Uh, Usually, you, you, you mistrust any instinct that there's randomness uh, in, in that relationship because it is so closely monitored and controlled by uh, Israel. They had an enormous amount of intelligence about the uh, new Gazan uh, missiles that were, uh, had been smuggled in uh, since the uh, end of the 2009 uh, invasion of Gaza. And, and how complicating that m might be in, in some future contingency in which I Israel saw itself going after the Iranian nuclear complex and worrying about being hit at home from both ends of the country by uh, uh, Al-Fajr missiles coming out of uh, Gaza and, and Al-Fajr missiles and other uh, longer range missiles coming out of the Hezbollah controlled territories of southern Lebanon. I, I, you know, I, I can tell you the questions I ask myself. I ask myself whether Netanyahu wasn't clearing the boards, clearing the decks in a way, in the same way that he has pulled the election forward. Uh, he will take a very strong mandate. He will replace part of his government with a more right-wing uh, set of, of, of characters uh, so that when they do come uh, up for what they have forecast will be their final decision-making process on whether they attack Iran. He will have his ducks, his political ducks at home lined up. You have to then ask yourself the question, was Gaza another, uh, a, a, another piece of that uh, um, pacifying the southern front, uh, eliminating the missile threat by going in and dropping bombs, uh, taking out the tunnels, putting them back so far that they can't rearm uh, to an extent that the southern part of the country will, will lie as exposed as presumably the northern part of the country is going to be if Hezbollah uh, cuts loose in any is mm. Israeli assault on, on Iran. Uh, so I, I looked at it in those terms. But there, there are other undeniable factors 
uh, in play. Uh, they were in the, in the middle of an election uh, campaign, and all of the uh, opponents uh, from the labor side, from the more liberal factions, were out campaigning on domestic issues, on economic issues, on jobs and, and prosperity and, and quality of life. Uh, and it was like a zipper went across the society, and the only image was Netanyahu and Ehud Barak dealing with the very serious issue of security. And if you are a politician in, in Israel, the, the, the mantle that you want to be wearing is the one of Mr. Security, because it, it lines up and unifies the nation. It mobilizes the country behind your leadership, and people forget, tempor however temporarily, uh, that there are other issues uh, facing the country, because security burns at the center of everything. Just a point of information, when is the election scheduled now for? Yeah, yeah, January, uh, January 22nd, I believe. Yeah. And, you know, it seems that um, the peace movement is sort of dead in Israel. Is that your...? No, I, I don't think that the uh, peace movement is ever uh, dead in Israel. It is, is certainly hard to find. It's certainly uh, 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 below a periscope depth. Uh, but but uh, the polling continues to show that there's a you know majority in in, in both communities, uh, Arab uh, and is, and um, uh, Palestinian and Israeli, that is interested in a deal provided that uh, you know certain uh, you know threshold requirements uh, for each uh, constituency are reached, such as security for the Israelis uh, and for the Palestinians, uh, return of lands. Uh, 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 the division of Jerusalem and, and, and some compromise on the right of return. So uh, I, I tell people who are uh, uh, pessimistic about this issue to remember the Cold War. I mm. mean, we all believed that our generation would go to the, uh, to the cemetery uh, still fighting uh, uh, Moscow uh, over uh, divide, you know, the division of the world in the Cold War. And one morning we woke up and it was gone. Uh, and if you look at the trajectory of conflict in the Middle East from 1948 uh, up until uh, uh, Camp David when Jimmy Carter closed the deal uh, on the Egyptian front uh, to Bill Clinton who nearly closed the deal uh, in, a, uh, in, in the last, literally the last days of his administration. Uh, we, you know, the world is about that close. Uh, with some, still some very tough issues and, 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 and large uh, compromises to make, but the world is come about that close to a settlement in the Middle East. It's possible. Israel's at peace with Jordan. It's at peace with Egypt. It is a time when uh, peace, uh, another peace accord, a final status accord, uh, could give Israel an, amaz an amazing new set of relationships in a region that has now awoken uh, for a new political uh, era. And would, uh, if, if you take away that searing core issue, uh, that has animated politics for the last 40 years, the Arab-Palestinian dispute, uh, everything seems possible uh, uh, in the wake of that. Patrick, you mentioned uh, the Arab awakening. And uh, to what extent does that uh, make it more likely that peace might uh, in some way move forward? And to what extent is there a discussion in Israel about how Israel's position in the world has changed as a result of the Arab awakening? Uh, <coughs> I think it's a very crucial moment uh, in history, the, the, uh, uh, and a, a very dangerous moment. It is very uh, easy, and the, certainly there is a, there is a, a large class of, of uh, uh, Israelis who look at the Arab awakening as extremely threatening, mm -hmm. uh, as a return to enmity, as a, as a growth of the Islamic threat uh, of the, the, in the same way that we look at al-Qaeda. Uh, and fear that they are doomed in some way to uh, endless warfare to protect themselves out into an uh, unlimited uh, f uh, future. Uh, and then there's, there are other groups that see uh, uh, opportunities uh, in this awakening. Uh, but uh, uh, you, you can't move uh, on engagement of the Arabs at this crucial period in the way that Israel needs to engage the Arabs to be helpful, constructive, and fruitful in its, in, in its quest for kind of laying down the foundations for a new uh, set of relationships in the region without getting back to the, solving the core issue of the Palestinian uh, problem. And, and that's got to come first in a way. I'm not sure that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't see it that way. A large part of, his, uh, of the political majority in Israel today doesn't see it that way. But just the emergence uh, this week of Tzipi Livni uh, and with her determination and spirit uh, to take on uh, Netanyahu again on, uh, with this as the centerpiece issue, the future of the Palestinians. She's going to lose. She's going to lose badly. 
but it shows that the spirit is alive and if, they, if, if a constellation comes together again, a political constellation, and who knows who's going to lead it, whether it might be Barack coming back or Tsipi Livni if she learns how to be a, a, a more clever politician, she hasn't been up to now. Uh, that peace majority could reemerge the same in the, in the same way it did under Yitzhak Rabin. In your previous book, World of Trouble, it was really an assessment of every American president's uh, relationship with Israel. How would you assess the Obama first term, um, you know, just overall in terms of the issues of peace, relations with Israel, and what do you think that the second term may bring? Uh, you can't look at the Obama first term and not see that he raised uh, expectations uh, uh, remarkably and then didn't fulfill them, and that that was a great disappointment to him and to most of the people in the Middle East, and certainly uh, the Americans who were interested in, in promoting the, uh, a peace agenda there. I think he, you know, he, like many presidents, you come into office with a very steep uh, learning curve, and, and that he, uh, Obama is an intellectual who believes that it, the, the thing you do as a president is get the policy right and then try and line up the politics. Uh, and and r really, it's the inverse. You have to line up the politics before you can start thinking about what policies you can squeeze into those into, within the bra brackets of that uh, 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 political uh, 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 formulation. Uh, George, uh, George W. Bush uh, recognized instantly as a political man uh, what 9-11 had conferred upon him in terms of political opportunity. You, you could see it in his face those first two days of 9-11. I mean, certainly it was a national tragedy, but there was a sense of exhilaration in the man that his place in history had been elevated in terms of the potential. He had just been handed to unify and galvanize the country and move it in some direction. Uh, we, we can debate how he moved it. Uh, uh, but, he, but he was given that great opportunity. So Obama, Obama hasn't had that opportunity. He thought he could create it, and he thought he could take the goodwill that had been generated around the world by those speeches and the interviews he did in the first months uh, to roll uh, and Netanyahu uh, to uh, overcome his uh, uh, recalcitrance uh, uh, to take the steps that were necessary to return the, the parties to the table in the, in the Middle East. And he got defeated, essentially, by... Uh, uh, by the Israeli government, by Netanyahu, and, and by its supporters here in Washington, uh, in our country, and in the Congress. Uh, uh, I, uh, the one criticism I would make of, 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 of the first four years is when he realized that he was going to have to put it on the shelf. Remember, he had said at the outset, I'd rather start on it early than wait like Clinton did to the last, uh, the, the last months. When he, was forced, when he realized he was going to be forced to do that, he didn't come up with a bridging strategy or a bridging dialogue with uh, the region that could maintain the faith, as it were. And instead, he started parroting the lines, almost the lines of APAC talking points on the Hill and whatnot in a way that uh, I think uh, uh, ex was extremely frustrating to all those people who had projected their hopes on him in the first term. Now, all that being said, I think in the second term, the, you know, the level of expectations is probably more chastened. Uh, but it's still there. It's still very high. Uh, I think that Obama is, a, a, is an idealist in the same way that Jimmy Carter w was. Carter is more derivative of his, of his religious upbringing, that his devotion to the notions of peace uh, in the Middle East, whereas Obama, I think, comes at it more intellectually, but more as someone who has lived outside of America uh, in, in, and looked back at it and sees it, has seen it the way other people in the world do, and therefore understands more intensely the importance of this issue to the world. And so he would, I think his idealism will compel him forward. Uh, but that, that being said, <clears throat> he is now facing towering domestic issues, economic issues. Uh, and every president has to look at the Middle East and say, do I want to get up on that high wire uh, while uh, I can't afford to lose one senator uh, or 10 congressmen on the votes that are coming uh, on the uh, avoiding the fiscal cliff, uh, straighten out, straightening out the long-term debt, reforming uh, the entitlements programs, all of those domestic issues <coughs> that we know are crucial uh, to our future as, as a country. Uh, and it's a very, very tough balance to strike. 
I, so my suspicion is it's going to get kicked down to the last months of his administration. And if he takes, he'll make a calculation in his last year about what are the legacy swings I can make, like a batter at the plate uh, trying to hit a home run. What are the swings I can make in my last months to try and close something? And it will depend on who's the prime minister in Israel at that moment uh, and how strong he is. Uh, and, and where the Congress is on the issue, because he will have to, and uh, no president can undertake this without some kind of base in Congress. I'm going to open up to the audience. Um, you wait for the microphone, identify yourself, ask a question, and we'll start with some of the ones in the back and then move <coughs> forward. To your last point, uh, doesn't the urgency of the Iranian situation and uh, the view from many Arab countries that Iran represents the greater threat to them as opposed to Israel create an, uh, an earlier opportunity for peace with Arab countries previously aligned with the Palestinian Arabs, perhaps uh, providing the kind of pressure that was needed at the end of the Clinton administration, but applied in the context of the Iranian threat early in the second Obama administration as a force for peace? Uh, my impression in watching it <clears throat> over the years is that you can't peel off the Arabs from the Palestinian issue uh, by arguing that they're a more important um, uh, fish to fry. Uh, in the Middle East. Uh, I, I think we w deluded ourselves, and certainly the neoconservative movement deluded itself in the George W. Bush administration by arguing that a realignment of the region, uh, toppling of Saddam Hussein, uh, a, a complete uh, makeover of the region, a democratization in, in, in Iraq that perhaps would have spillover effects, uh, w would simply push away, overpower the Palestinian issue. But uh, I, I think uh, uh, it, it, it is sometimes difficult for Americans to understand how <coughs> radioactive it is at the core of, uh, of, of politics uh, in the region. There are many things going on, and, and you can find any Egyptian on any given day who's thinking more about what his country is going to be like in the next year and in the next five years than, than what's happening in Gaza. But as soon as you, put, you bring him, you know, turn on Al Jazeera and he sees what's going on, and in Gaza, it brings it all rushing back because it's a central, it, it's not just about the Palestinians, it's about the relationship of the region to the great powers also. Uh, and the demand that has been so uh, uh, profoundly powerful in the region that uh, the great powers respond uh, on this, uh, re respond to that. So I, I think there, there's a great deal of urgency uh, with the Iranian I issue. It, it, I think America has to is going to have to work as the middleman, uh, one side a relationship uh, basically of restraint, preventing Israel from going off half-cocked uh, on, on a mission that will drag us into something that we will all regret, uh, and at the same time dealing with the Arabs uh, who are, are coming to us uh, looking, for, looking to us for leadership uh, in solving the Iranian crisis. I sense a lack of urgency. Uh, in, the, in the White House more than urgency in, in the sense of, of, of scaling back. And uh, uh, we don't know what, what uh, 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 secret circuits, and back channel uh, circuits that are active in, in uh, communicating uh, to the Iranians uh, that uh, uh, the outlines of, of various kinds of uh, uh, compromises on their nuclear program. Uh, and so I, 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 I don't see it as an issue that can, that can pull uh, the, the two sides together by uh, somehow shunting the Palestinian issue to the side. This lady here in the blue. Thank you. My name is Catherine Mattress. I was wondering about the op-ed that Yossi Balin published in the New York Times on Monday saying that the United States should support the Palestinian bid for recognition at the UN. Um, as a way of undermining Hamas and strengthening the PA, sort of last chance, I think, for the PA. Um, what is your point of view on that? Uh, the United States has opposed the bid basically because Israel opposes it, but would it really be in our interest to support it? And I'm a little bit confused. I, I'm very supportive of the Palestinians, but 
I'm a little bit confused about whether this is really in the Palestinians' interests, although I certainly think it would be in their interest if they had the ability to use things like the uh, International um, Court for Human Rights Purposes. Yeah. I think the, the uh, statehood issue is somewhat of a, of a diversion. Uh, there are plenty of people in the world who would uh, like to upgrade the Palestinian status at the United Nations as, as, as mainly as a way to give them a, a, a measure of support, buck them up a little bit, because they're going through a long period of stasis in which they are powerless and, and divided and unable uh, to control events in, in any way. Uh, it is a diversion any time you, you, you go down a road that can't take you to what the, the essential equation has to be, and that is uh, two parties at a negotiating table working out a final status agreement that creates the Palestinian state. And so I, I think it is, it, is, it is a little bit like a, a formal intifada. It is the leadership class of the Palestinians uh, uh, trying to throw off uh, you know, the strictures that bind them uh, from getting anything else done, from making any progress, and from showing their people uh, that they can get any kind of results. If they can promise that they might get the result of increased recognition and that that would be an overall good thing, uh, I think the, you know, if you're a political advisor to Abu Mazen, uh, you'd say, why not? L let him go for it. It, it agitates, it, it, it keeps the issue alive, it agitates people, it shows the great powers that if they don't work on the important front, that, we're, that we have our own detonator strategy, that we'll blow something up politically at the UN that you'll, that'll take months uh, uh, for you to clean up. So it, I, it's a diversionary uh, uh, symptom of the lack of progress on the main event. Person here. We're coming, we're moving forward. You'll, you'll get your turn. <laughs> no, I can see you. I'm uh, Ed from American University. Why all this emphasis on Iran and their enrichment procedure? Enrichment, enrichment, <coughs> enrichment. It's all we, we get. What, what's important is not enrichment, but their delivery system. What about the delivery system uh, like, uh, beholden to the U.S. and Israel and the European nations? Do they have that capability, or is it just enrichment? It's all we hear. Uh, they're working on lots of capabilities. Uh, you know, uh, China over the last, uh, I don't know, since I've been a, uh, a newspaper man, uh, has been uh, sending missile and selling missile technology uh, to Iran. It, it, if you remember the tanker war during the Iran-Iraq war back in the 80s when the, the uh, Iranians were firing these big uh, Chinese-made silkworm missiles out over the waters to uh, blow up uh, oil tankers and try and shut down the oil commerce through the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, they have been building their own indigenous uh, 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 ballistic missiles. Uh, they're working on, they worked on the Shahab-1, the Shahab-2, the Shahab-3. Uh, they they uh, very recently uh, had a series of, of test launches to demonstrate uh, that there'll be a serious uh, 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 contender to uh, launch uh, uh, long-range uh, ballistic missiles, which is the threshold in which you demonstrate to the world that you can carry a mili military warhead in, in such a vehicle. They also have uh, a aircraft. Uh, delivery systems today in our modern world, it, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to think through what all of them might be, but they're asymmetrical possibilities of using low-tech uh, delivery systems. I mean, if you've ever been in the Persian Gulf, you know how close the distance is between the Iranian shoreline and Rastanura, the Saudi main oil loading terminal just across the Persian Gulf, and that, that, that how that Gulf is full of maritime commerce. I mean, low-tech maritime commerce, like those wooden dows that Sinbad the sailor used to sail up and down the Persian Gulf. You could pack a, a lot of explosives into one of those and, and, and get it close enough to uh, uh, industrial facilities on the Saudi side that you would terror you could terrorize the uh, the region just by setting one off. Uh, so uh, 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 uranium enrichment is important in in the threshold of of nuclear weapon weaponization for military purposes and uh, delivery systems uh, technologies are going apace uh, in in par on parallel tracks. I'm Hamid Lilou, um, uh, Middle East Africa analyst for ProSol in support of USMC um, Operational Culture Center down in Quantico. 
Uh, first, thank you for your uh, great <coughs> presentation. It was a, a historical um, overview. In a couple minutes, we could learn a lot about the uh, history of Israel. Uh, my question is related to the last event that uh, actually triggered the Gaza events with the killing of the head of Hamas security, which, by the way, was behind the release of the Israeli uh, soldier. Shelley. And uh, he was working uh, closely with uh, Israeli security to solving other problems. So I wonder why kill someone that actually was able to achieve a lot in the interest of Israel. And um, as your title said it, they cannot make peace or they don't want to. As some people in the Middle East say that uh, the state of Israel cannot sustain without the state of war. Thank you very much. Well, there's a long history of uh, targeted uh, killings in the Israeli uh, security establishment, and e each one of them is debated internally by a, 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 you know, around the table with the prime minister, usually with his, uh, uh, someone from a, 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 the legal jurisdiction, the jurisdiction, his attorney general, uh, but also the heads of the intelligence services and the, and the military, and in military intelligence services. And, and, and they debate. And uh, in the case of uh, al-Jabari, who was the militant, military chief of, of Hamas, uh, he had been running those operations for a, a long time. He may have been involved in, in the holding and the hiding of, of Galad Shalit, the young corporal who was held for more than five years. Uh, he, he may have been involved in a number of, of uh, attacks and the smuggling of missiles and missile technology in, into Hamas. Uh, <clears throat> he may have also evolved as a political figure as, as there were some reports during that week that he was interested in discussing or beginning negotiations on a truce between Hamas and, and, and uh, uh, the Israelis. And of course this reflects back to earlier assassinations that occurred in the middle of discussions about whether a truce uh, was about to uh, emerge uh, uh, or, or that Hamas was interested in, in accepting one. When the paraplegic preacher uh, Ahmed Yassin, who was the founder of Hamas was assassinated in uh, 2004. He had just sent a message, uh, uh, made a statement that he was interested in Hudna. He was he had a friendship with a with an Israeli rabbi uh, named Menachem Froman, uh, in which they were working on a, a religious formula to solve uh, the conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though he was a, a remarkably violent man. I mean, he had driven Hamas to a state of where it's, it, 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 it was a terrorist organization. Uh, he was also a moderate of, in, in, uh, of, the, of the Hamas leadership in that he believed that a long-term truce with I Israel was kind of like the Shanghai communique, if you remember that, in China, where both sides of the Taiwan Strait, the Taiwanese and the Chinese, agreed to basically put the war issue on hold and just remain uh, doing business for the next 30 years, with the Chinese believing that Taiwan would be absorbed and with Taiwan believing it would become independent. Uh, and you defer the war issue that way, mm -hmm. and you let the people knit the two societies back together. Uh, uh, Sheikh Yassin had that kind of vision about the future, and uh, others have uh, in Hamas. And, and there are you know, Israeli intelligence chiefs who understand that and who believe that, therefore, Israel ought to be talking to Hamas. Uh, Ephraim Halivi, who was the head of, deputy head of Mossad under Yitzhak Rabin and was uh, Bibi's first Mossad chief, uh, has been arguing uh, forcefully that, uh, as Rabin said, you only make peace with your enemy, so you've got to talk to your enemy. So uh, that, being, that, being, that being said, that when the, the security establishment spends months preparing <coughs> an assassination package, uh, the momentum uh, to carry out that assassination becomes a political issue within the cabinet. And uh, sometimes the momentum of, of those constituencies, those military chiefs who have to go before the Knesset for their budget every year to justify the weapons they're buying, the, the Hellfire missiles, those helicopters from which they shoot the missiles that uh, are used in these targeted killings, they have to justify themselves. And so sometimes that military uh, uh, zeitgeist can overpower any competing political argument 
that, wait, maybe we ought to be talking to this guy. He seems to be more moderate, or he seems to be interested in a truce. Uh, it's hard to say what happened in Jabari's uh, case. He had blood on his hands. They're in a war. Uh, somebody said, let's kill him, and Netanyahu said, OK, uh, because he, the, it is the prime minister who makes the final decision. Uh, it will be a long time before we know what the other factors were on the table. This lady here. My name is Mary Ann Stein, um, a longtime member of Americans for Peace Now, um, which has been trying <coughs> to persuade both sides um, to move more towards peace. Not very successfully, obviously. But I'm curious to know, um, there have been a number of articles and pieces written very recently that there, this aftermath of the Gaza, uh, the latest Gaza action, may actually provide some opportunities, some unique opportunities for um, moving a piece forward. And in your comments, you said that you thought that um, it's very likely that Obama will not pick this up, which I rather agree with. Um, but I wonder if he were so inclined, what you think the opportunities would be and how he might go forward. And also, I'd just like to throw in that there are an awful lot of people now saying he should send Bill Clinton over. I can't imagine Bill Clinton would take it up. But if he were to, he, he's incredibly popular in the region. Um, and there are many people who believe he would use that and his political savvy um, to advantage. Mm. Interested in your opinion on those two points. Well, the first one is just uh, is a hypothetical, which uh, I, I won't spend too much time on. If, if, it, if now were the time to do something, what would you do? Well, I don't know. You, you know, call them to Camp David, call Abu Mazen and a Hamas leader and, uh, uh, and uh, Netanyahu to Camp David. Netanyahu wouldn't come if Hamas was going to be there. Um, if, um, if Hamas joined Abu Mazen's government, uh, plenty of ministers in Netanyahu's coalition would say, now it's a terrorist government, we can't do business with it, and, and try and set uh, preconditions. And overcoming preconditions is a lot of what the work is of getting people to the table. Jimmy, Jimmy Carter spent his first year really banging his head about how to do it. He was interested in basically convening a peace conference in Geneva and thought he could get the Soviets to help him pull the parties together, and it completely f failed. And Diane and Begin and everybody, uh, and even Golda Meir came out of retirement and started slashing at Carter across the water. Uh, and, and he had to walk away from that and then, and then uh, got the idea just to, to get them, you know, call them to Camp David and start any way he could, and thought, and thought until the last minute that he had failed. And, uh, uh, so um, uh, you, you'd have to start it by looking at what, of our, what are the graces, greatest points of resistance on, with each party now, and how could we possibly uh, overcome them. Uh, Congress would be up in arms. Uh, there'd be letters every day f from 87 senators or 95 senators or you know, 333 House members uh, insisting that the president stand up for Israel's rights. And, uh, it would be hard, to, and, and you can imagine where the fiscal cliff negotiations would go in that kind of uh, uh, atmosphere. Bill Clinton uh, is an inter I've, I've heard the same uh, and reports with interest. Uh, the problem, uh, and Bill Clinton is extremely popular uh, with, with the Israelis, uh, with certain Israelis. He didn't like Netanyahu, and Netanyahu didn't like him. He tried to jam him pretty hard every time he would come to Washington. Uh, and uh, the, the, the basic problem for bringing Bill Clinton into the equ equation is how. I mean, he is no longer the president of the United States. And even if he was the high profile negotiator for this president, only the pre it's the president and his administration that are pushing uh, for some resolution. And um, I rather think that it'd be very hard for Bill Clinton to come uh, go into that process as effectively as we remember him when he was uh, president and undertook the same efforts in the last day of his, days of his administration. It could certainly help him a lot. Uh, uh, it might even be more efficacious if you brought Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, who uh, is still missing a legacy in his life, uh, and, and uh, uh, have that bipartisan cast to it. 
Hmm. Uh, might be an interesting way to uh, approach it. Very hard to go up against Netanyahu when he's going to come, if he comes out of this election with, uh, with a landslide uh, mandate uh, and, a, and a tougher, harder uh, cabinet. Uh, but uh, uh, th th that's what makes me think it'll get pushed back uh, to the, uh, to the uh, end of the second term. Patrick, um, is there any sense in Israel that Netanyahu tried to jam Obama too much and that it's backfired now that Obama is in a second term? Uh, there doesn't seem to be any penalty for uh, 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 Netanyahu's uh, jamming the president. He's popular. His popularity is, uh, keeps going up. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, he, he may be into a real election fight, but the economy is good in Israel, which is always an important factor. The, 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 the state of security, uh, even though they had some missiles coming in uh, from, from uh, Gaza, is pretty strong. Uh, Tel Aviv is this great Mediterranean city that lives in isolation uh, to the squalor and oppression that exists within 50 miles of it in occupied territories. Young Israelis, I'm always uh, startled by the fact that young Israelis uh, are so ignorant of what goes on over, just over those hills and no longer and long cease to care what goes on in Palestinian villages and towns and, and along that fence and, and whatnot. And so uh, the separation uh, is intense and it is politically debilitating uh, for, the, for the peace process. Uh, uh, so, uh, where it's going to come, where the initiative is going to come from, is hard to say. The gentleman right in the front has been patient. Very patient. Uh, we've got two gentlemen. Start with him and then you. Yeah. Okay. Mohammed Al Hussaini from the Arab League. Hi. Um, thank you, Patrick. Mm -hmm. um, just I wonder uh, uh, for how long do you think that this military m mentality will continue? A Palestinian who read your book, he will think that's. The only way to peace is to counterattack or to fight. But really, there is no way for peace. Uh, should the Palestinians and the Arabs wait for another generation, or one or two generations, who are uh, on the Israeli come, who are really ready to make peace? Anyway, the Gaza in uh, incident, I don't call it war, proves that still, no matter how weak you are, and the other party is strong, you still can, other outside powers can limit the power by intervention like the United States and Egypt, although I feel the United States is the one really mm. who did most of the pressure. So what do you think? Uh, I think that history tells us that uh, uh, those times when uh, progress has been made most uh, dramatically, there has been some uh, intervention from the Arab street uh, that energized it to some extent. I mean, the Intifada being the, the largest and the most poignant of all of those, there was a completely spontaneous event uh, that shocked both sides and had a profound effect on Yitzhak Rabin, who had been a Sabra, who had grown up within the military system, who, was just, who built the army that won in 1967 and was just about as tough a guy in the Israeli military you could meet. And he looked out at, across those smoking, tires, right, you know, the smoke coming out of Gaza and out of the West Bank and said, there's no military solution to this. We've got to come up with a different approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and he crossed the Rubicon. It was the first time uh, since Moshe Sheret's time that an Israeli prime minister had crossed the Rubicon like that. I don't, I don't think you can count Begin, although what Begin did was extremely important, but he didn't come to a sense that there was no military solution with the Palestinians. He wanted to take the West Bank and, and uh, uh, Gaza because he believed they were part of the historic lands of Israel and he, he, so he coveted them and, and he really uh, made the peace in Egypt because that cleared the way for him to go after the PLO and destroy Arafat and he thought he would then get a compliant Palestinian community that he could impose uh, peace on. But now today you have to ask yourself the question what is Netanyahu waiting for because uh, at some point uh, in the not too distant future, the demographics are going to put him in Israel in the position of being uh, w what even its, its, its own leaders refer to as an apartheid state, where you're not granting rights to the Arabs I that you rule in occupied territories or that, either, that are even Israeli citizens. Uh, and, and, uh, and therefore, they are subjugated. And what kind of moral foundation uh, can you rest 
the Israeli and the Jewish uh, uh, state uh, for future generations uh, in that kind of configuration. Um, Netanyahu doesn't have an answer for that. It, it, and, and when you try to infer that uh, answer from you know, the, the preponderance of his statements, it, it seems that he's still playing a, a, a strategy of time. And, and that is, it is something his grandfather said, that if you wait long enough, you'll only have to give him 2% instead of 22%. It's that somehow that it's still politically viable in his mind that you can have a trunk, a, a, a Palestinian entity that is so truncated uh, and so obscure and, and, uh, and invisible uh, with uh, Israel rampant in the territories with the IDF security, the airspace, everything. And these contained uh, villages of Arabs who uh, uh, have rights in name only, that somehow that's still possible in his mind and that, 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 that his part of the right wing uh, from his father and and, uh, and Jabotinsky, who his father worked for, who was the founder of the Israeli right, um, believed in that kind of formulation that uh, if you wait long enough, uh, uh, you'll win and you'll get the thing you want, which is almost all of the land. Mm. This gentleman here. I'm Amar Masdi Khan. I, I write mostly on Balochistan. Mm. I would please like to ask you, uh, why hasn't the United States and Europe done more to, uh, to make the Muslim countries, only a few countries, recognize Israel? Why hasn't the US and Europe prevailed upon the rest of the Muslim countries to recognize Israel? Another is, uh, you see, the way Israel looks upon uh, nuclear arms of Iran, why isn't it concerned about the nuclear arms of Pakistan? Hmm. Well, there was a time in this city uh, when it was extremely concerned with the nuclear arms of Pakistan. Uh, I remember when I came to town back in the Carter years, when the, the books that were being written at the time about the Islamic bomb and the worries. Uh, there was a, a senator from California, Alan um, mm, Cranston, who spent a great deal of time holding hearings about the threat from a Pakistani bomb. And there was a sense that it was. Uh, um, it had to be opposed. There had to be strong uh, non-proliferation interventions. Uh, yeah, I think he's asking about why isn't Pakistan, why isn't Israel more concerned about the Pakistani bomb? Not a why isn't Israel? Well, I, I, I was giving the American answer, but I think in the, the, the same parallel uh, existed in Israel at the time. But why is it today? It's a very good question. Uh, uh, I think it, be, it believes that uh, the United States, uh, uh, the U.S. relationship with Pakistan uh, and uh, the effective uh, uh, American uh, suzerainty over the Persian Gulf region as the pr uh, preeminent military power uh, uh, is a prophylactic against the dangers of that bomb. I don't think they accept it as, as something that's inevitable for the long term. And if, if they had their druthers, they'd, you know, they, they'd be happy if it disappeared. But they are, they're pragmatic about the fact that it, it exists uh, and there's, there's nothing they can do about it, but they have energized their, I think, their friends and uh, supporters here to make sure that there's a very uh, active American uh, policy and probably a lot of intelligence sharing uh, to make sure that that program doesn't become a threat uh, to Israel. Um, your first question is, uh, is was it American pressure to get more Muslim countries to recognize Israel? Yeah, I, I think that, that that's kind of the, uh, regarded as a counterproductive uh, exercise, given that the, uh, the Arab League and, and, and most uh, uh, Arab states believe that uh, the only uh, leverage uh, that they can uh, hold, uh, having given up the leverage of war, uh, is to withhold their recognition of Israel until the Palestinian uh, issue is is addressed and resolved in uh, in in some manner that is uh, satisfies the region and so I, I think any uh, Arab leader uh, that would uh, uh, call for recognition would 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 have to calculate very carefully what the, the reaction of his domestic cons constituencies even in Egypt the, the, you know the holding on to the treaty that exists is is quite a, a, a difficult and laborious uh, uh, exercise for the new Egyptian uh, president because the, uh, 
there's so much sympathy for the Palestinian cause in Egypt. So uh, I think that's it's just a question of leverage. It's uh, lo long term, the Arabs uh, w want to trade uh, recognition uh, for the establishment of a Palestinian state. And that's the core of uh, King Abdullah's offer when um, uh, Ariel Sharon was prime minister of the Arab uh, the Arab initiative uh, in 2002 was to trade recognition uh, for a uh, return uh, to the 67 borders, or uh, uh, practically so, to, to create a Palestinian state and have permanent peace between Israel and the region. I want to thank Patrick Tyler very much for his really brilliant presentation. He, uh, his books are outside. I'm sure he was willing to sign them if you buy one. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. <sir. laughs> Thank you.